right, everyone. Good afternoon, and welcome to today's session of the Washington History Seminar, Historical Perspectives on International and National Affairs. Uh, we're very glad to have with us uh, Luis Campos. He is the Bloomberg Chair of Astrobiology at the Library of Congress, Chairman of the History Department at the University of New Mexico. He's trained in both biology and in the history and philosophy of science at Harvard. His scholarship brings together archival discoveries with contemporary field work at the intersection of biology and society. He has written widely on the history of genetics and synthetic biology. He is the author of Radium and the Secret of Life, published by the University of Chicago Press, 2015. And or Making Munitions, Object, Practices, Contexts, published in 2010. Yes. Uh, he is the newly elected secretary of the International History of Science Society. Luis. Thank you. And thank you to all for coming today. Radium was like nothing the world had ever seen before. Unfathomably rare, intensely powerful, glowing in the dark, and utterly unaffected by any outside force of nature as it gave off rays of unprecedented energy, radium was perhaps the most wonderful and perplexing thing the modern world had ever seen, or had never seen, given that only the barest pinch of it existed at the dawn of the 20th century. The 88th element in the periodic table was stunningly and starkly new, helping to overturn established <laughs> ideas about atomic constitution and atomic behavior. But radium did not only lead us on the path to the atomic age that we're all familiar with, it was also instrumental for the biology of the early 20th century. What's more, it was both a real physical tool, as well as a powerful metaphorical and even a metaphysical tool for physicists and biologists alike. So today I want to tell the story of how radium came to life, how it played a significant role in the history of biology in the first half of the 20th century, and especially in the history of genetics. And I want to trace the half-life of an ongoing association between radium and life that lasted for decades and whose legacy still structures how we think today. Now, the idea that radium has anything to do with the secret of life may come as a provocation to you. If we historically inclined folks know anything about radioactivity or ionizing radiation and its effects on biology, it often tends to orbit around images and iconography of the bomb, of radiation sickness and illness, of mutation and sterility, of disease and of death. We'll get there, but <laughs> I want to take us back to the turn of the century first, to another cornucopia of images and associations, where radioactivity in general and the radioactive element radium in particular was related to vitality, to health, and to life. The story of this so-called radium craze at the dawn of the 20th century is a rich and a fascinating one, and I think you'll enjoy hearing a little bit about it. But as a historian of science, I also want to go a little bit deeper. I want to I trace how, over the course of the first half of the 20th century, radium moved across this spectrum from being quite literally a vitalizing element to being a shorthand for death, carrying us from a world of healthy radioactive vigor to unhealthy exposure and damage. And your laughter with this image suggests you're already familiar with that transition, right? How did we get from radium holding the secret of life to radioactivity more generally uh, being indelibly associated with the unleashing of secrets of death? How did the larger cultural context affect the actual content of scientific understanding, rather than simply being the arena in which science took place? And finally, how did this shift tie into the larger history of attempts to engineer and to modify life in the first half of the 20th century, from life as we know it to life as it could be? So in the time we have, I'd like to give you a brief taste of this popular radium craze, followed by three cases that are well-suited to help us explore how radium proved to be an important tool for investigating first the origin of life, then the nature of heredity, and finally the nature of mutation and the structure of the gene. And by sharing these cases, I hope to explore how powerful metaphors of radium's vitality became entrenched in experimental practices, so that even after radium drops out of the story decades later, the way we talk about genes continues to glow. So <clears throat> for an age, um, yes, that's the basic question we have here. How do we go from, from this to this? 
For an age where chemistry and physics were thought to be closing in on the last few secrets of nature, Wilhelm Conrad Röntgen's discovery of X-rays and Henri Becquerel's discovery of radioactivity came as a surprise to many. When Marie and Pierre Curie announced the discovery of radium in 1898 and found it to be some millions of times more radioactive than uranium, the world was entranced. The wondrous new element was unlike any other that chemists and physicists had encountered. It glowed in the dark, it produced heat of its own accord, it gave off energy that seemingly came from nowhere and that never seemed to run out, at least not for thousands of years, it was estimated. It took some time for the early radioactivists to understand that the energy released came from reconfigurations of the atomic stuff itself, that radioactivity was, as Ernest Rutherford and Frederick Soddy described it, fundamentally the discovery of transmutation the turning of one element into another. So atoms were no longer that which could not be divided. What's more, early work in radioactivity began to stitch together the processes of cosmic and biological evolution. Elemental transmutation seemed to imply a grand process of cosmic evolution of some sort. As unstable forms of matter existed as but temporary, quote, transition forms, physically unfitted to survive, Many physicists began to characterize the radioactive elements as those yet to be winnowed out in a kind of natural selection among the elements in the universe. The same phenomena that ruled the biological world were seen in some important sense to be active in the physical world. We have here the introduction into chemistry, they wrote, of a conception analogous to that of evolution in the biological sciences. Evolution, natural selection among the elements, atoms with parents, births, and lives, these new radioactive elements were even provocatively termed metabolons, and they had a half-life, not just a measurement of how long it would take for half of a given sample of the element to decay, and decay, of course, is another term consciously chosen in parallel to biological processes, but the word half-life was also chosen because it meant something more than mere measurement. So lifelike terms suffused the whole of radioactivity from its earliest days. Henry Adams had referred to the discovery of radium as physics stark mad in metaphysics. But this was a peculiar kind of metaphysics, a metaphysics of metaphor that ranged from the merely descriptive to the epistemologically compelling. Radium astonished the public more than it did the scientists, believe it or not. News of radium's wondrous new properties hit the popular realm in 1903, and that's a fairly sharp moment of introduction as these things go. Other historians have noted that far more articles were printed about radium in that year than in the three preceding years combined. Fantastic ideas for the uses of radium were expounded, from perpetual light to inexhaustible sources of heat. It was said that half a pound would be enough to keep a room warm for hundreds of generations. <laughs> A farmer in 1903 even wondered about the effects of radium mixed with chicken feed. The radio eggs would either hard boil themselves upon being laid <laughs> or would hatch the chicks without need for an incubator. And of course, either result was obviously a positive effect. So the craze grew with every passing year. Heaters, mysteriously named X equals radium heat, that's not a thing, but there they are, uh, were hawked on the market. And I found another uh, one of these in a, a place in rural Colorado, there's actually a radium stove that was there. We had health spas and hotels that were named after radium. By 1915, radium was even thought to be a stimulant to soil, and this even led to the hawking of radioactive manures. Radium paint, as some of you may be familiar with, was used to highlight watch dials, and by the 1920s, to decorate glow-in-the-dark costumes in darkened theaters, and ironically, even in games of radium roulette. Radium music and dances were invented. There were radium chocolates and cigarettes, crucifixes, watches I had mentioned, toothpastes, beauty creams, uh, clothing, and toys, even radium beer. So George Bernard Shaw had commented that the world has run raving mad on the subject of radium. Radium was viewed from the start as more of a stimulant than a danger, and by 1903, radium therapy was already widespread. Radium was used in the treatment of just about any disease. Patent medicines came out, along with pills and capsules, radium tonics, organized sipping seances, trips to radioactive springs and spas, even emanotherapy, that's the emanations of radium, and radium inhalation, the technology for which, interestingly enough, led to the development of the iron lung. 
even radium suppositories. <laughs> As one commentator noted in 1912, our brains are especially radioactive, the heart less so, and the kidneys still less. By 1914, radium was seen as being so natural to life that one onlooker noted it is accepted as harmoniously by the bloodstream as is sunlight by plant life. This seemed an only natural response to the early discovery that everything in the world, water, soil, air, even humans, seemed to be radioactive in one degree or another. So while x-rays, with their bony revelations, connoted death almost from their very inception, Radium rapidly came to connote life, becoming inextricably and essentially linked to conceptions of good health and vitality, and making it seem none more sinister than a frolic in the park on a sunny day. There were even debates about whether the sun was composed, at least in part, of radium. So radium had everything to do with life. There was no doubt that radium cured cancer. This is where our modern use of radiation in treating cancer comes from in some of its earliest iterations. And a regular method of treatment for stomach cancer was the ingestion of a radioactive drink with the liquid sunshine, as it was called, bathing the affected parts. Two cases were deemed cured already by 1904. So radium brought hope. Time and again, radium was described in popular lectures and in the popular literature with living terms. Radioactivity was described like a disease. It was catching, and it could contaminate an entire lab. Or peer into the spintheroscope, remarked one writer, and you will find, quote, dead radium displaying what suggests eternal life. Sir Oliver Lodge wondered if the secrets of the glowworm lay in the secrets of radium, while the director of the American Museum of Natural History, Henry Fairfield Osborne, speculated in the late teens as to the existence of a life element so far unknown, but that might be, he says, like radium, wrapped up in living matter, but remain as yet undetected owing to its suffusion or presence in excessively small quantities or to its possession of properties that have escaped notice. These suggestive metaphorical connections were not mere glib attempts to play etymological games. They had very real experimental consequences. While Osborne had proposed equating life with some element like radium, several of his predecessors had proposed equating radium with something like life. In the first decade of the 20th century, a young man by the name of J. Butler Burke, in a series of widely publicized and rather infamous experiments, found himself at the center of this radium life nexus. As one contemporary reported, on June 20th, 1905, the scientific world was startled by the sensational announcement that a momentous discovery concerning the origin of life had been made by an English scientist. Working experimentally at the famous Cavendish Laboratory in Cambridge, Mr. John Butler Burke, a young man in the prime of life, succeeded in producing cultures bearing all the semblance of vitality, unquote. The world at large first learned of Burke's epic-making discovery from blaring headlines um, that came along the following day in the London Daily Chronicle. This is the first one here, so I've just taken here and blown it up so you can see it, but there's even larger stories that come along with pictures and even his signature that get uh, depicted later. Word of Burke's discovery crossed the pond almost instantaneously, and it also hit um, below the fold, I believe, the front page of the New York Times with an equally sensational effect. Generation by radium, Cambridge professor reported to have produced artificial life. So Burke seemed to have discovered the means of creating life at will in the laboratory. As the Times then asked three weeks later, has radium revealed the secret of life? Recent investigations held by some to justify such a belief. Plunk a bit of radium chloride or bromide in beef gelatin or bullion, Burke said, little more than beef stew, others said, and the result is a new transitional form, not quite living, but exhibiting many of the characteristics we take to be essential to life, he claimed, appearing to grow and to subdivide over a span of days and demonstrating other lifelike phenomena at the cytological level. Burke's growths could ingest, grow in the dark, multiply their numbers by dividing, and even it appeared they showed the structure of the nucleus of a cell with the attendant phenomena of karyokinesis, the movement of chromosomes during cell division. Nevertheless, these growths decayed in sunlight and they dissolved in water, so that was rather distinct from most recognized forms of life. Burke held that his experiments called for a reconsideration of the nature of life itself. His growths were clearly neither bacteria nor crystals, he claimed, and their metabolism seemed to be somewhere between accretion, an inorganic process, and assimilation, a living process. Half radium and half microbe, these radiobes, 
Burke suggested, served as a missing link, he said, and as such were suggestive of both the nature and the origin of life, even if they themselves were not living. He published a couple of grainy photos along with his initial report to the journal Nature that you just saw, and then he published these other photos that came along later. Existing at the limits of vision, Burke's growths were at times extraordinarily difficult to see, ranging in size from less than one sixty thousandth of an inch by one account to the merest of specks. Contemporaries reported that they were only visible with a very high power of the instruments, scarcely visible indeed with one sixth inch focus power, plainly visible with one twelfth. Resolving the nature of these growths then required frequent reference to Burke's photographs, and I'll put that word in quotes here. Most of these photographs were not widely available until he published his findings in his 1906 book, The Origin of Life, Its Physical Basis and Definition. As the Daily Chronicle remarked, photographs of the magnified growths showed globular dots signifying nothing to the unexpert eye, but much to the trained intelligence of the scientist. So although to us these may look more like hand drawings than photographs, what is significant is that um, they were taken to be evidence for something that was perhaps true, perhaps not, but it was at the least at this time believable. And Burke's photographs were of enormous interest. They also, however, required constant interpretation. Burke's findings were immensely popular and controversial. The radiobes were called the most surprising discovery since the first isolation of radium by Marie Curie. They were touted by one newspaper as a discovery that has provoked more discussion, perhaps, than any event in the history of science since the publication of The Origin of Species. Not only reminiscent of life, radium was said to have literally vitalized matter. Burke's experiments highlighted a productive role for radium in illuminating the fabric of living processes, even if not necessarily or actually a constituent part of them. And what I find interesting here is his novel use of radium provided for one of the first experimental approaches to the question of the historical origin of life on Earth, which had previously been open to speculation. Given radioactive decay, the cosmic environment of the early Earth would have been much more intensely radioactive. And so this was a model system for exploring that. He held that his system was illustrative in certain important respects of this primeval environment of the early Earth. The distinguished chemist, William Ramsey, called Burke's experiments mad. <laughs> he explained the radiobes away in physicalist terms as salt precipitates, but he was intrigued by the idea of the artificial creation of life. Even so, Ramsey understood where Burke was coming from. He speculated that if the radioactive decay theory of radium were correct, then, quote, the philosopher's stone will have been discovered the transmutation of metals. And it's not beyond the bounds of possibility that it may lead to that other goal of the philosophers of the Dark Ages, the elixir vitae. So the alchemical element par excellence radium held the secret of life, even for a skeptic. Others, of course, waxed even more poetic than Ramsey on the possibility of creating this missing link between the inorganic and the organic realms at the limits of life. The popular science writer C.W. Salibi had commented in 1903, Thinking men hesitate to believe that there is a difference in kind between living and so-called lifeless matter. If anything in the world is alive, is not radium alive? And a year later, in reviewing Burke's discoveries, Salibi concluded that the question of whether Burke's radiobes were really alive or not depended on considering, quote, the reputed behavior of an atom of radium. So the connection between radium and life at the dawn of the century thus consisted of more than mere metaphors that described radium in lifelike terms, decay, half-life, daughter elements, as the physicists had done very readily early on. The connection was literally materializing in the creation of these putative radiobes. Despite Burke's failure, his work had pushed the realm of biological possibility for radium to its limits. The half-life of these connections played out then over succeeding decades in ever more concrete ways. New experimental systems came along out of the same metaphorical and metaphysical hot dilute soup that had spawned these radios. And one prominent botanical investigator working early in the century roundly criticized Burke's work as ridiculous, but he felt compelled to ask, if radium could not be used to produce life, perhaps it could nevertheless affect life. So radium's powers were then soon to be tapped in the quest to gain control over the very processes of evolution itself. I'm pleased to have as our guest Mr. Galen Windsor from Richland, Washington. I first heard of Galen 
from a tape that somebody gave to me some months ago, and I found his story to be absolutely fascinating. His story is uh, unique, to say the least. Galen has been in 77 different cities in the last two years lecturing on the subject of nuclear energy. The majority of his life, the last 35 years, he spent processing plutonium from nuclear reactor sites. He's worked in the Manhattan Project facilities in Hanford, Washington, Oak Ridge National Laboratories and Nuclear Plant in Oak Ridge, Tennessee, General Electric's Midwest Fuel Recovery Plant in Morris, Illinois, General Electric's Fuel Fabrication Facility in San Jose, California, and Wilmington, North Carolina. And he's worked in every major reactor decommissioning project around this nation up to this present time. His major work in these projects has been the analytical process inventory control, which means that he was responsible for measuring and controlling the nuclear fuel inventory for these projects. Galen Windsor has few peers in the world in this area of expertise. And those few peers admittedly know and agree with the things that you'll be hearing on this tape. However, except for two or three of these experts, they've all chosen to remain silent for reasons which they only know leaving this man then the burden of leading this lonely battle of exposing what we call the nuclear scare scam. He's without question one of the world's foremost authorities in nuclear radiation measurement. And he's recognized by members of the Atomic Energy Commissions of all the major nations of the free world. Mr. Galen Windsor. Thank you, Ben. We've been considering today how best to approach this subject so that you would feel comfortable with where I am. And we thought it might be appropriate to start with how I got involved in this game. Now, in 1945, I was a Navy radio man out in the Pacific on a destroyer aimed for Japan. We had a one-way ticket. That's all you get, just one way. So as we uh, were becoming proficient at our business of fighting war, the Manhattan Project caught up with us and did a job. Now, the weapon that was dropped on Hiroshima, Japan in August 6, 1945 was a U-235, fully enriched U-235 weapon, where the material was separated and purified in Oak Ridge, Tennessee. The one that was dropped August 9th on Nagasaki was a plutonium weapon made at Hanford. But to those of us out in the Pacific, it was quite interesting. It had a ticket on it that says, you get to go home. I was impressed. Now, I was stuck out on Guam after the hostilities quit and was running a radio broadcast that communicated with 4,500 ships west of Pearl Harbor. Quite a few to listen to every dot and dash that I made. So I, I was used to having people listen to me. They couldn't see me, but they could sure hear me. I had all of the good messages that were to come to them. Fleet movements to Red Cross messages. They came along one day and says, we'd like to have radiomen to go down to Anahuitoc for the atomic bomb tests. Not me. <laughs> no way. <laughs> I want to go home. So they went through and they took every third radioman to go to Anahuitoc. I didn't go. They let me come home. But I wanted to go home. I had a driving need within me that says, hey, that big firecracker, I want to know how it works. I want to know everything about how it works. So back to the ranch in Nevada where I grew up and stacked hay all summer 
gained back the 40 pounds that I'd lost out there in the islands. Into Brigham Young University in the fall of 46 in chemistry classes. And Dr. Joseph Nichols could make an old farm kid like me love chemistry. I hadn't had any chemistry in high school, but the way Joe Nichols taught it, I wanted to know. So chemistry it was, and some neat guys like Carl Eyring taught me physics. And long in 47, I ran across a cute blonde from Richland, Washington. Now this girl had been telephone operator for General Leslie Groves and Dr. Enrico Fermi on the Manhattan Project. She got to put through the calls to Franklin Delano Roosevelt for these guys, so she talked personally to FDR. And she told me some of the stories like you've never heard. She says, oh, in those canyons, great things are done. This cowboy from Nevada couldn't even imagine what she was talking about. Well, in 1947, after we were married, I see, I ran until she caught me. I wasn't going to get married anyway. I wanted to get my education. I had to get on with this thing. And so we went to Richland, Washington for the first time in September 1947. I saw that those buildings she was talking about were there, 1,000 feet long, 11 stories high, five of them below ground, uh, tremendous things. And people all over, Camp Hanford in those days was a whole army camp just there to secure that place, to provide security, thousands of soldiers. You move around out in the desert and up out of a foxhole and pop a soldier with a gun in his hand. There wasn't any horsing around. It was all business. Back to school. In 1950, I applied for a job up there before I'd graduated, and they were so in such bad need of chemist, I had a job before I had my degree. And so the last year of my chemistry, mostly English, I did on a bus riding 25 miles to work in the morning and 25 miles back at night, and I did advanced grammar and business writing and all of those things on that bus. But in September 1950, I got into this thing called plutonium processing when we did it barehanded, without instruments, without coveralls. We had some of the most peculiar acid burns in some of the shirts. And I found one of those the other day. It's got acid burns all up the front of it. Plutonium on it, too. Amazing. That was normal operation in those days. We ran those facilities, and we ran them so well that by 1965, we had separated enough plutonium when it only existed in the parent uranium matrix to a half of a single weight percent, 0 0.005 weight fraction of plutonium maximum in that fuel, and we processed enough tons of uranium to recover enough plutonium by 1965 to meet the weapons needs of this country ten times over for the foreseeable future. Now we're talking about a massive amount of work, hands-on, do-it type thing. And there was a couple thousand of us, and we were just happy as could be, just working like mad, making those plants run 24 hours a day, seven days a week, in a community that ran on shift work, A, B, C, D shift. The whole community that way, a wartime community, people dedicated to doing a job, and we were doing it, and we did it well. No pretense. Oh, yes, there were out in the reactor began to sneak in people who wanted a radiation monitor behind every reactor operator. Why? 
We know how to make these things run. When we got a metal fuel element stuck and it fell down on the trampoline back of the reactor, we'd go in with our feet and kick it off into the pool, smoking, burning. If you didn't have an instrument, you didn't know it was too hot, so you just went in and kicked it. Finally, along came a rule maker that says, thou shalt not do that. You'll get burned. Oh, I didn't get burned when I did it last week. But you exceeded the limit. Well, where did this limit come from? Turns out that in 1934, the International Commission on Radiation Protection fabricated a limit for x-rays. It was no longer permissible to be burned by them, erythema, reddening of the skin. You now had to keep a limit called two-tenths of an hour per day. How much is that? Well, you've got to have one of these Beckman instruments to read it, and you have to keep time of exposure. You know, there are four requirements on this thing the size of the source, the, therefore the strength of the source, the distance from the source, the time of exposure, and the intervening shielding to keep from getting burned. Oh, fine. We've been doing this thing for years now, and we've never been burned. Why have we got these rules? And they says, yours is not to ask questions. Yours is to do and die. Don't you ask questions. If you do, you might disappear. Those who broke the rules didn't appear the next day. Military rule? Oh, yes. Absolute. What was your appeal? And people you were working with one day, when they weren't there the next day, you didn't go inquire why. You were just grateful you still had your work to do, and you kept right on doing it. Now, this is in the United States of America. Well, in 1960, we found out that the uh, materials that we were working with the thing that we called high-level waste, that if you waited three years, these million-gallon tanks that high-level waste went into boiled off 15,000 gallons of water a day. Fairly hot? Oh, yes. This material that if it ever broke a line would seal itself off in the ground within a foot, make its own glass. It wasn't going to go anyplace. We did that a time or two. Accidentally, of course. And so we started packaging this cesium-137 in casts in railroad cars like that and shipping it to Oak Ridge, Tennessee. And they'd take it out and make it into a barium titanate and press it into a pellet. And those things were so hot that they actually glowed in the dark from the infrared heat. Now. Thermal ionic conversions came along at this time. So you hook these little heat sources up to thermionic converters and you took electricity out this side. No moving parts. These things went into the SNAP program. And these uh, early SNAP power generators are what power the underwater transmitters for our nuclear navy. We've got a regular road map under the sea. All you've got to do is have an instrument that knows how to find it, and then you've got eyes on a submarine. You didn't know that, did you? The power from it came from this material that they now call waste. We processed that stuff and packaged it outside at Hanford. Well, we had rules that said 3R per year is your allowable exposure, that amount of gamma energy that will expose a film pack. But that was for the people that uh, didn't know. We weren't about to follow those rules. We just went ahead and did the job. They sent around an investigation slip that says your dosimeter was overexposed two weeks ago. What did you do? And they had a cute little form on it that says accidentally exposed to light. And that was the one I always used to check. Because it's the same amount of light. You know, if you get gamma through the film pack, 
It's the same amount of light as you get when you click the lens on a camera. They wanted to limit us to that. And one day we looked up, and they had. They had limited us to that amount of exposure. Then the fun part of the game begins. You say, who limited us to that? Are they powerful? Yeah, they control the purse strings. They live by the golden rule. Them that's got the gold makes the rules. If you like your work, you keep the rules. If you don't keep the rules, you disappear. Sure enough, some of us disappeared. Some of my friends gone. Where'd they go? I don't know. Well, two years ago, I started traveling for American Opinion Speakers Bureau, and one of the documents that they had was Major Jordan's Diary, a story of shipping the technology and the materiel that was developed at Hanford in 1944 directly to Russia on U.S. Air Force planes out through Great Falls, Montana, Fairbanks, Alaska, under the auspices of one Harry Hopkins, and with the at least tacit approval of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Now what are you going to do? That thing that we had been doing and feeling so good about had been shared at no expense with Russia. You go back and you check the record and you find Russia did not develop their own nuclear atomic weapon until 1949 even when we supplied them the material and the knowledge. Four years after we touched them off at Hiroshima and Nagasaki. We weren't happy with that. We were just happy doing our job. Well, in 1965, General Electric was ready to leave Hanford. I'd worked for General Electric for that 15 years. And they took me out to California San Jose, and we had in mind to design and build this nuclear fuel reprocessing plant at Morris, Illinois. They told me they were going to build it at San Luis Obispo. That's how they got me away from Hanford. But that was just to get me away from Hanford. I got to design the sampling analytical system for this plant. The sample cell was the hydraulic heart of this place. I got to dictate where they put the columns, how high the columns were in relation to my sample cell. One man standing in front of a lead glass window could sample any liquid stream in that whole plant. It took crews of men at Hanford to do the same thing. I wasn't happy with that, so I built an efficient system. I got to design that. I got to build it. Conceptual design, detailed design, build it, operationally test it. And in 1973, they says, forget it, friends. You don't get to run it. We had 170 tons, metric tons, of spent fuel stored in the basin. And the then president of the United States, do you remember who it was? Jerry Ford. Says, uh-uh, friends. No way. You don't get to run it. That's when I started to kick over the traces. Up to that point of time, I thoroughly enjoyed my work. I had no limitations, practical limitations. I had all the money to spend. I was in charge of the design effort. I built it the way that I wanted to because it was technically correct. All I had to do was check with engineers and make sure that it was right. And all of a sudden, I was told, you must reduce your limits of exposure by a factor of 10. I says, huh, I won't do it. First thing you know, you got the word that says, oh, yes, you will. And I says, no way. Well, that's when the rebel, Galen Windsor, started to show up. And when I found out that by management conference I couldn't get to these guys, I figured out another way. Now, in this pool is, in this plant is a beautiful pool. It's got uh, a place to store spent fuel bundles till it won't stop. 660,000 gallons of water, demineralized, just as clear and pretty as it can be. 
heated to 100 degrees Fahrenheit when the outside temperatures are a minus 20, wind chill factors down to a minus 60, and I found out that I could swim in that rascal. You turn off the lights at night and it had a light blue Kerenkov effect. And this kid from Nevada that never could pass up a warm swimming hole used to go swimming in that pool. There wasn't anybody that had the nerve to swim with me, but since I was manager of safety and analytical service of this plant, it was mine to use. Oh boy. I found out that I could do that. I showed some financial types one time that I could stir that pool with my bare hand and check out through the same radiation monitors they did without triggering it. GE didn't like it. I got a letter from them that says, thou shalt not tell financial types that you can swim in the pool, that you can stir it with your hand, because if they find that out, they will steal the inventory. They will know that the inventory can be stolen. Oh, is that an valuable inventory? The same material that's labeled high-level waste by our current government, our current Congress. Now, plutonium is an interesting chemical element. It is created in a nuclear reactor. The Manhattan Project built eight of these reactors at Hanford. The first one took 12 months from sagebrush to nuclear steam to build, and it had never been done in that size before. How could they do that? Why did they do it? To create this element called plutonium. Plutonium has been assessed as being the most hazardous material on Earth. Now, from the standpoint that you can make an atomic weapon out of it, yes, it is quite hazardous because a piece of it that big, two and a half kilograms, that's only five pounds, is the force that delivered 20,000 tons of TNT equivalent over Nagasaki. Indeed, it is hazardous. The one over Hiroshima that had fully enriched U-235 in it was five times as big. So plutonium is more dangerous than U-235, is it not? By a factor of five takes five times as much U-235 as it does plutonium. Therefore, it is the most hazardous thing. Enter the great pretenders. They said that five grams of plutonium properly distributed over the face of the Earth would kill everybody on Earth. Now, if you can only get one 20 kiloton weapon to go on 2,500 grams, how's five grams going to kill everybody on Earth? Early on, I had a fear that said, if there is this much fissile material, that that can undergo a chain reaction, we called it in the beginning, then if you set a match to it, all the fissile material in the world is just going to keep right on going. Totally unfounded fear. It turns out that when you're in this business of recovering plutonium, like we recovered so much of it at Hanford, we found out that if you have it in a solution where it's less than 5% plutonium, it won't go critical any way that you kick it. And when you get it to 100% plutonium, you better be careful. Because if you put it in more than a 5-inch diameter cylinder, you're playing with fire you can undergo what is known as an uncontrolled criticality, accidental criticality. The air turns blue. If the, pres if the cylinder is sealed, it will explode from steam pressure. And that steam pressure builds up in a millisecond, which is about that long. No, you don't horse with it. And then you find out that those eight-foot-thick shielding walls on those canyons were put there because they didn't know how much was a critical mass? They says, if we make a mistake, we don't want to die, so we will provide the shielding. 
And so this shielding thing started for no other reason than they didn't know what was a critical mass. Well, through the years, we got pretty good at telling what a critical mass was. And I have worked in a plant where I had half a critical mass in this hand, barehanded, dressed in street clothes, half in this hand, wearing a lab coat, and I'd put this half in a pocket on this side and this half in a pocket on this side and walk down the hall. If those two ever got together, there would be a blue flash. They never got together because I was in between them. And we do that every day. And each half had to meet definite dimension characteristics. And so we'd take them down and pass them one half at a time, and they'd measure it and say, yeah, that one will pass. And then we'd pass them the other half, and that one will pass too. But they were carefully put in separate bird cages so they couldn't get together accidentally. Well, those of us who worked with it enjoyed it. We knew what we were doing. We worked at it. When the President of the United States decided not to operate that fuel reprocessing plant, I started scrambling to find out what was going on. Many things had been done in the name of health and safety. Don't get burned. You've got to have a safety record. You have to be safer than anybody else. We were already safer than anybody in the whole world. Well, you can't get afford to get burned with this. You've got to enforce the limits. You've got to keep it. And I says, hey, that's not what the ball game is at all. I'll bet you the ball game is something else. And in 1982, when the Congress passed the Nuclear Waste Policy Act of 1982, a guy by the name of Mo Udall, I don't know whether you people in Arizona have ever heard of him or not, authored that bill. It's called the High Level Waste Disposal Act of 1982. The material he called waste is the reusable uranium fuel that I had been working on for 32 years. Needless to say, Mo Udall and I do not agree on whether that material is waste or not. The name of the game, then, is who owns the plutonium and how much is it worth? The government says, bury it 3,000 feet deep in basalt, and we'll hold a contest among the states to see who gets to bury it. Oh, why do you want to bury it? Did you ask the owners? Who is the owner of the plutonium? May I submit that it's most likely the nuclear power ratepayer. He has paid for the mining, the fabrication of the parent uranium, power generation, and is being charged in advance for its burial. If you're paying for it, to whom does it belong? How much is it worth? In inflated dollars, a ton of reusable uranium fuel contains useful metal isotopes worth upwards of $10 million a ton. Mo Udall says it's high-level waste. The value of reusable uranium fuel scheduled for permanent disposal probably exceeds the national debt. Naturally occurring plutonium quantities, and you know plutonium does occur naturally, plutonium-244 is found at the residual activities of the several, eight at least, Oklo phenomenon reactors across the world. First one found at Gabon, Africa. Naturally occurring plutonium quantities have been enhanced by transmutation of uranium. That's the reason we built reactors in the first place. Our ability to detect and measure emissions from these elements is useful in inventory control. When fissile elements, fissile isotopes, 
are present at less than five weight percent plutonium-239 equivalent, and the heavy metal oxide matrix is stored dry in air, it has no critical mass. Remember we talked about shielding was because they didn't know what a critical mass was? If it is light water reactor fuel at less than 5% equivalent fissile content, you can handle it, you can do anything you want with it, you can stack it up, you can have a room full, you can have a handful. As long as you keep it dry, it will not sustain a chain reaction. What then is all this falderall about a little bit, five grams, will kill everybody in the world? Uh-uh. They don't know what they're talking about. And when they say that, they're thumbing their nose at measurement experts like Galen Windsor. I am insulted when they say those things and get away with it because it has no bearing on the truth. It cannot be mishandled. It will not expose any person to an unshielded nuclear reaction. In other words, no controls are necessary except to prevent the pilferage of the inventory. Have you got that one? Let it register. Do you need governmental rules and regulations and instructions? No way. Then why do we have all of those rules? Inventory control practices capitalized on the fear of undereducated masses who work in the industry. I didn't say anything about ordinary people now. I'm talking about the people who have worked in the industry and those who cast stones from without. The Ralph Nader's, the Jane Fonda's. Now, it doesn't take you much thinking to find out that maybe the industry is the source of the problem. The industry is the one that made up the committees that made the rules that the Congress enforced. You ever thought of it that way? The strangest kind of feather bedding that's ever been dreamed up, it makes the railroad engineers look like pikers. The only amounts of fissile process materials that are of health concern to the handlers are those that can accidentally cause an unshielded nuclear chain reaction or that will cause erythema from the shortest wavelength, highest frequency, and therefore the most easily shielded ultraviolet light emissions of the electromagnetic spectrum. Big words. Let's see what they mean. The emissions from uranium, plutonium, cesium, all of those things are only important if you assemble an amount that if you get this amount and this amount together, it can go critical. You can get a blue flash and therefore get burned. And that's happened 34 times in the business, and eight men have died as a result of that. Accidental criticality. Documented in Los Alamos document 3611, if you want to check the source. Or if you've got enough of it together that it's giving off ultraviolet light of this particular wavelength and frequency without any intervening shielding, enough to burn you, sunburn you, erythema, reddening of the skin. If it's less than that, if the effect is less than that, then what is the problem? Excessive government regulation. That's what's the problem. Tritium, heavy, heavy water. Deuterium is hydrogen-2. Tritium is hydrogen-3. 
if you let an inventory get away from you, what's going to happen to it out in the biosphere? Nothing other than it will become diluted and join the naturally occurring inventory of tritium, because tritium is created in the upper atmosphere by sunlight. We have a natural inventory of tritium. Then the only thing that happens when you release tritium, which is the trigger mechanism for bombs, it's the source of the push that makes it go, is that you lost a valuable inventory. Then what of these people that are pretending that a little bit of tritium is going to do you in? It is not so. What are those two points? Only if it is an economically recoverable concentration or if it has a natural reconcentration mechanism. You know, there isn't any one of the radioisotopes out there that has a meaningful level of reconcentration in any of the species, not even the oysters in the bays in Maryland below Calvert Cliffs. Hmm. Why then are we still playing this game that any amount of this material is of hazard? Reusable uranium fuel, which has been isotopically enhanced in power-producing reactors, is a valuable national resource, not a high-level waste. The utility operators recognize the future worth of this commodity. Mo Udall, in that Nuclear Waste Policy Act of 1982, imposed a tribute of a mill per kilowatt hour, a dollar per megawatt hour, on all electricity produced in a nuclear plant so that they can research and develop methods to throw it away. Why do the utilities willingly pay this amount to the Secretary of Energy? To limit their liability exposure. Who pays that amount anyway? The consumer of nuclear generated power. You have no choice, and therefore I call it a tribute. At the same time, they have provided their own storage basins at these reactors at ratepayers' expense to retain ownership control of the plutonium resource. So you consumer, you ratepayer, you taxpayer are paying for the storage of this fuel, and WNP2 at Hanford has storage that will take them through the turn of the century, and yet every day they are paying a tribute to the Secretary of Energy with the concurrence of the United States Congress and signed by the President of the United States in 1982, 83. Who was that? Ronald Reagan. They have provided those storage basin at ratepayer expense to retain ownership control of the plutonium resource. I started playing a game one day, seven years ago. I says, okay, Portland General Electric, you've got the Trojan reactor, you've got a storage basin problem, I'm going to make you an offer. I made them an offer that says, I will take all of your spent fuel, FOB your basin, if you will give it to me. In other words, I will take it off your hands at no expense to you. I will ship it, I will store it, I will do everything that needs to be done to that fuel. And you know what they told me? Can I quote them? Go to hell, Galen Windsor. We value it more valuable than platinum or gold. We're going to play the plutonium futures ourselves. Now, where did I learn that the name of the game is who owns the plutonium and how much is it worth? The first plutonium I saw was in a glass tube on the newsreel when I got back from the Pacific in 1946. And that that they had in a glass test tube, they said, was worth a half a million dollars. Certainly they had less than five grams of plutonium in that tube. That's pretty expensive stuff. 
And so for the show, they put a pot underneath it in case they dropped it. They said, we'd want to have to pick it up out of the rug. When we decided, when it was decided for us not to operate this plant, plutonium was guaranteed on buyback by the federal government at $43 a gram. That's quite a price drop, don't you think? When that price guarantee went away in October of 1971, the price of plutonium became $10 a gram. It steadily went down to where its present worth on the market is a minus $2 a gram per year. That's what it costs you to hold on to a plutonium inventory on a material that has been declared worthless by the utility owners and rubber stamped by the Congress of the United States, and they're spending billions of dollars digging holes in ordinary rock so that they can throw it away, dispose of it. Okay, what are you going to do with it? Reusable uranium fuel may be properly stored in air-cooled dry storage in a cost-effective manner. Newchem in Germany offers this immediate and long-term option as a necessary and safe step prior to reprocessing. They're doing it in Europe. At least four reasonably located facilities are available in the United States where this concept can be used right now. Barnwell Nuclear Fuel Plant in South Carolina Midwest Fuel Recovery Plant in Morris, Illinois, this one. Nuclear Fuel Services in upstate New York, and Redox Processing Plant at Hanford, Washington. These fully shielded, already radioactively contaminated storage areas have secure, limited access. All have been operated under processing conditions of 10 CFR 50, and the MFRP has a 10 CFR 70 storage license, the only licensed storage facility away from a reactor in the United States. It singly, all by itself, is capable of storing all of the reusable uranium fuel that needs to be moved away from power reactors for the remainder of this century. We had that storage designed in 1975. Had the approval of the design. Why then are you spending money over here in New Mexico on the waste isolation project? Why are you spending money at Hanford at the basalt waste isolation project? Why are you spending money at Beatty, Nevada for storage when I can already store it in this building that's already built? I just named you three others that can do the job all by themselves, too. And I know where there's 14 more buildings that can do it. What are we going to do? Redox and other excess facilities at Hanford are capable of dry storing all commercial REF until plutonium recycle, at least through 5% enrichment, is reestablished or until the 22nd century, whichever comes first. RUF can be cost-effectively stored in existing facilities. Where does Mo Udall came off then, saying that you cannot use this plant for its intended purpose unless it is owned by the United States government? He has said that. The waste isolation projects are politically mandated wasting of national energy and construction resources. Plutonium proliferation by diversion of stored reusable uranium fuel is of minor importance compared to global availability of fully enriched uranium by laser isotopic separation. Let me explain that last thing that I said. Jimmy Carter said you can't ship plutonium to India, but in the same paragraph said you may ship them fully enriched uranium. Oh, Jimmy Carter, 
that peanut brain? What did he just say? He says that when the Israelis took out the reactor in Iraq, they had fully enriched uranium from France. And he says those rascals, those Iraqis, are going to take that fully enriched uranium, put it in that reactor, irradiate it to plutonium, and therefore have to recover the plutonium in a plant like this, and we stop them when the fully enriched uranium makes a better weapon than the plutonium in the first place. Now, when the President of the United States says things like that, and when the press gives it credibility, I get insulted. And right after I get insulted, I get angry. And I've been angry for quite a while now. And finally, one day, I said, my own personal security is not important. I think I'll go tell this tale. All I want is to tell my story. The commodity that I communicate is called truth. And so then I ask you a question, a very brief, pointed question. Who owns the plutonium and how much is it worth? And then I'm going to attach on to that a question I want you to think about till we talk again. If you haven't been burned by this particular source of radiation, what is your problem? You obviously have one. Otherwise, you would join with me in telling the truth about this particular commodity. And so, yes, I'm recruiting helpers. What happened to the guys who taught me the business? Thousands of them. The hands-on business. Where are they? They're still there. Why don't they talk? Who are the they that say, this is the way the business is going to be run, whether it makes sense or not? We're back with Galen Windsor, and we're talking about the nuclear scare scam. Galen, it seems to me that from what I've heard you say that uh, the scaring of the people is better than a lock and key to keep this stuff out of the hands of those who might be interested in investigating and keeping this valuable material hidden for just an elite few. This is probably the way that it works best. And so then the secret was to keep from letting other people know that it could be handled because, first of all, we weren't accepted by the community and the materials that we were working with, they feared. But there were certain few people that realized its real worth, its potential to be used in ways other than to support our national defense. Let me ask you a question, Galen. Are you, are you worried about your... Do you have reason to be worried about your personal safety? Because... The kind of people that you're describing here uh, are powerful people. I wonder if you're still around. I wonder how much longer we can expect you to be in this game. Well, on the 13th of December last year, the NRC, Nuclear Regulatory Commission Region 5, turned out a federal SWAT team to get me on a federal warrant issued by Bob Thomas out of Walnut Creek, California. It was kind of funny in a way. They turned out this federal SWAT team at Hanford, and they had my picture. And alongside it, it says, this is an irrational individual. He poses a threat to our security. Take him at any cost. Now, the reason that I'm still here only has one logical conclusion. I have lots of help. Well, you've told us about how that you and others of your friends and colleagues have handled many times this so-called deadly nuclear energy material that uh, the whole world is so scared of. Uh, why weren't you afraid of it? Because we did silly things like uh, recover some of the undissolved fuel elements out of the redox dissolver that burned a hole in it. And we went in and sampled these things by remote process. We got it out into our hands and found out that we could walk around the lab with them barehanded and they wouldn't hurt us. And we were standing there in the lab tossing them back and forth. 
uranium metal that wouldn't dissolve in the boiling nitric acid. Well, if you find out that you can play with it and it was only 90 days since that thing came out of the reactor and it doesn't burn you, why should you be afraid of it? So in other words, you're telling me that uh, you learned to not be afraid of it because of practical use and application and hands-on experience. Hands-on. We might have even been playing games. Okay, you say that you swam in this water that was straight from spent fuel used to cool that fuel and yes. you swam in it. Yep. You told me earlier that you went a little bit, little bit beyond that. Would you share a little bit of that story? Well, swimming in it didn't have the desired effect. So I decided I had to be more direct with these people that were giving me trouble. They are kind of hard to teach, so I went to drinking a glass of it a day. I had the bottle of it. Uh, last time I went swimming, why I filled this two-liter bottle with water and washed it off on the outside in the shower when I washed me off on the outside so that we didn't tattletale. You know, radioactive material is just a trace or a tattletale. So you got to get it off so they won't know that you've been swimming in the pool and drinking the water. So I took this bottle in and set it on my desk. And who would suspect that the manager of safety and analytical service had a bottle of spent fuel pool water sitting on his desk and he drank a glass of it every day? And this was unheard of. Nobody ever did that crazy <laughs> stunt before. <laughs> How has that affected you, uh, Galen? Well, as near as I can tell, it made me about six foot four in my cowboy boots, 210 pounds, and really quite a nice fellow. <laughs> All right. What then happened as a result of your doing this strange experiment on your desk with this water? What was the result? Can corporations have a heart attack? I think General Electric had one because after they ran me through a whole body gamma scan in December of 1974, by the time I got out, because I had a plutonium lung burden and it took 45 minutes to an hour to count that, everybody on site knew that the manager of safety had been sw swimming and drinking in the swimming pool, the spent fuel storage pool. I had cesium-137 at a ferociously high level. It ex even exceeded the NRC's limit. And I'd been drinking it. They knew the fat was in the fire. Now, where do we go from here? Well, first of all, I got a poison pen letter from the people in San Jose. <laughs> and he says, thou shalt not do those things. They'll find out that the inventory can be stolen. Well, that didn't sit very well with this cowboy because nobody tells me what to do, particularly when what I do is right and hasn't harmed me. Who are they to tell me what I want to do? It just didn't sit very well. <laughs> I was going to do something about that. What was your motive in this? Correct information. As an expert in the measuring system, why it was very obvious that I knew the parameters of inventory control, the disintegration rate of each of these isotopes, how to measure them. That's how we regulated our inventory. And to have these rascals come along and start playing games with the information that I was very expert in, that I had designed the analytical system for this plant around, disturbed me a little bit. Now, it made me fighting mad, and I got angry. And I have to admit, in retrospect, that for the next five, six years, I was more than angry. I was hard to live with. Just ask my wife. Well, in your estimation, then, how dangerous is a nuclear reactor plant? A nuclear reactor plant is just a way to boil water that's the cleanest, neatest, most economical way to boil water that you've ever seen. And so, in my estimation, Nuclear reactors ought to be insured under the same insurance policy as any other steam boiler plant, power generating plant. And to have special consideration under the Price-Anderson Act means that the insurance industry has already paid off the Congress so that they can have a ripoff, charging ever in higher and higher insurance premiums total coverage much, much greater for a non-existent risk. What a racket. 
Can a nuclear plant explode? Only like any other steam plant. Like Laughlin, Nevada had a steam explosion. It's a coal-fired plant, but six men were killed there last year. That could happen at a nuclear plant, but as far as an atomic explosion, good heavens, no. No way. What kind of accidents can actually happen at a nuclear reactor generator plant? You could lose your moderator and the reactor would shut down, the control rods would stick in and you wouldn't be able to start it up. Uh, you might uh, do several things that would uh, invalidate some of the safety controls. For instance, an emergency core cooling system. The only reason they put ECCS on a reactor is to destroy it. When you start these big babies up, because they're so big, you only warm them up 50 degrees an hour. And they say, we got an emergency, throw the emergency core cooling system on like they did at Three Mile Island 2, and you're going to thermally shock that big machine and ruin it so it can never be used again. Let's talk about Three Mile, three mile Island. What, what really happened there? We've heard all kinds of stories about meltdown and... Uh, uh, they made movies on it uh, that uh, this meltdown could melt right through the earth, clear through to China, and, uh, and we've seen a lot of scare stories. What really happened to Three Mile Island? Do you know what really happened there? Yes, I do. I followed that one very closely. Uh, in fact, I know the guys personally who wrote the script for China Syndrome and also wrote the script for the Three Mile Island fiasco. Dale Breidenbaugh, Dick Hubbard, and Greg Miner, who used to work with me at General Electric, are the MBH associates that wrote that China Syndrome script. And not only that, remember that was the time China Syndrome came out, Jane Fonda starring. Fourteen months ahead of the TMI-2 accident, it was predicted in writing in New York State that that accident would happen one year from the date that that Three Mile Island 2 reactor started up. It started up in March. 1978, and it went down March 28, 1979, right on the day, one year anniversary. In other words, with 14 months advance notice, the industry still went along with the sham. Nothing happened there except that the owner, the operator, and the regulators conspired to turn it off. What melted? The top of the fuel rods, the third time that the core got uncovered, uh, due to internal pressure, blew the top off some of those rods. They've got Inconel springs in them to keep the pellets, fuel pellets, from vibrating when it's running. Those things are under compression, and when they reduced the outside pressure and the fuel rods were still hot, it blew the top off some of those fuel rods. Uh, the fuel rods in TMI-2 are internally pressurized to about 1,200 PSI with helium gas so that they don't reverse dent when they're hot and running for five years. And when they dropped the outside pressure, why that internal pressure with those hot rods blew the side out of some of those rods at the top. But melting, the fuel is already an oxide ceramic. It uh, is a pellet. It's been pressed into a ceramic. It, when you pick it up and feel it, it feels like metal. It's pressed so very, very tight, hard. And so, no, the fuel didn't melt. The China Syndrome is a scriptwriter's fantasy. Uh, Right here, I'll tell a story, I guess. See, I spent uh, three weeks on the island in March of 1981, the two-year anniversary of this particular, quote, accident. And Tom Hall, who stood alongside Enrico Fermi when they pulled the control rods on 100B in October 1944 at Hanford, and I were delegated to go to the island and find out what happened, and so we did. We went over all of the records and everything else, and... And there, as we could tell from performance records, 51 thermocouples, for instance, uh, only one of which went over 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit. The center line temperature of those rods when they're running is 4,032 degrees Fahrenheit. <laughs> and so they say things like over 50% of the core was greater than 4,000 degrees. Yes, it was. If it wasn't, it wasn't running at 100% power. So they take that kind of information and bugger it all up so that you don't understand what's going on. They give you a little bit of it. Well, the worst 
joke that people could dream up, and they says, do you know what the NRC's worst nightmare is? No, I don't know what that is. Galen Windsor and Tom Hall in the TMI-2 control room for an hour by themselves. <laughs> you know why people that know laugh? These crazy guys from Hanford would have started that baby up and showed that it would run. We'd have started it up, and they were afraid of us. So there was no accident at Three Mile Island? No, they did it on purpose. Shut it out. Very interesting. Can nuclear radiation cause mutation in people and animals? Uh, uh, if a cell gets too much radiation, it dies. And so if it is uh, a sperm or an oocyte, why, they die. They don't reproduce, and there are no mutations. I think the good Lord built that safety factor in. So you're saying that mutation in future generations is an unfounded fear. Yes, and the studies of the people at Hiroshima and Nagasaki have borne that out. Those people do not have that. Now, they showed the immediate effects of too much radiation. The women who were pregnant uh, showed, the embryo showed the effects of very similar to rubella, measles. Some deformity, certainly, from that in radiation insult. But uh, that's not the kind of mutation that's going to go on to the next generation. Galen, what and where are these burial sites and what's in them for this so-called nuclear waste? I've been hearing stories about stainless steel containers buried in concrete under the ocean boiling for over 2,000 years. That, sound, that sounds like a real story. Uh, let me start out by saying there are no nuclear waste, only materials created in a reactor to be recovered and used beneficially. Now, high-level waste is radioactive and self-heating. And so fuel, uh, reusable uranium fuel, fits that definition. But if you disregard its intrinsic worth, why then, yeah, it would fit the definition of high-level waste. But let's say there isn't any high-level waste, only material to be recovered and used beneficially. Then what's the low-level waste fiasco? That's an excuse for a federally mandated, non-inspectable disposal system so that organized crime can get rid of any evidence that they want and it can never be dug up again. They're afraid to look in there. I'm not afraid. They don't want you to. They've got rules on the transport so that if you have an accident with a low-level radioactive waste shipment, why well, you call out all of the state police and you make sure that nobody looks at it, that nobody gets exposed, that there's no spreading of the contaminated material. And it's also that you don't find out whose body's in that drum. The situation got so bad that the, the smell of human flesh was so great that they made it so that you could ship animal biological waste in refrigerated vans so that it wouldn't stink up before you got it buried. What, what is then in these low level or high level or whatever uh, containers under the ocean? Nothing. But if you... See, they were one time dropping uh, barrels of radioactive waste off barges in the ocean. Do you know what was in them? Not high-level self-heating radioactive waste. Probably had a few bodies and a few guns and a few knives and a few evidences in them, too. If you drop them in the ocean, they are truly disposed of. So you know there's an international trade in that right now? You can't do it in the United States, so they transship it across the ocean to South Africa, and they can bury it offshore. So what is in those drums? Well, that's what you're telling me, then, that I, <laughs> that I needn't worry about boiling drums under the ocean for 2,000 years. No, no way. Thank you. I'm glad to know that. Well, one, one more question, Galen. What uh, do you feel like a good portion of these men in Congress know this already? I know they do. I went there four years ago and sat down with the Senate legal staff and told them my hour and a half long sad story. And Sam Bollinger, one of the lawyers, stood up and he says, Galen, if I understand you right, why you want us to have President Reagan snap his finger and make this thing come up straight? And I says, hey, Sam, 
terrific. Go ahead and do it. He uh, didn't take that challenge. He says, no, I'll tell you what, Galen, industry likes it the way that it is. I said, Sam, you really know how to hurt a guy. And he says, well, if we change it, what are we going to do for an encore? Yeah, they're fully aware that this thing goes on as far up as the President of the United States. It's the way that industry wants it. The industry is its own problem then. So the question is then, what is the industry? What is the real story here? Is this an industry of nuclear energy? The industry has been ripping it off for years and years. In 1975, we knew that large nuclear reactors were dead that large is not the way to go. The way to go is small, mass-produced nuclear reactors sitting right in the middle of town, one ever ten blocks producing power. We haven't built a reactor right yet. It's time that we do it. Why haven't we? Because of a federal energy cartel. These guys control the amount of electricity, the availability, and the price. And they say, you do not have a choice. I have a choice. I'm going to take one of those decommissioned nuclear subs up in Puget Sound, refuel it, and generate my own electricity. Save the government $5 million because that's what they want to throw them away. I will use it for my own power probe. Quinn Million up in Omak, Washington, and I are moving on that. And if one of these days I hook one of them up to Pier 91 in Seattle, don't be surprised. Well, good luck. <laughs>
Do you want the white stuff or the black stuff? White stuff? You do. There's enough in there to kill four men your size. The government says we got to ban this material. It's radioactive. Let's check it in the bottom of the bottle. Not very radioactive. Let's take the cap off. Oh, my goodness. Very radioactive. This instrument will only count gamma, energy. It's just energy. Lights coming from those lights. Only you're getting lots of infrared from the lights as well as ultraviolet. Energy response, and it's very carefully damped to only discriminate it so it only gets the energy that comes from this. I don't want it to respond to a light, just to this. Cost me a thousand dollars to get an instrument that'll just respond to this and not to that. This is radioactive by any definition. Radioactive material giving off radiation that is read by an instrument like this. The daughter of this, radon, cannot be read on this instrument because it gives off alpha particles. An alpha particle is a dipositive uh, particle that comes from the nucleus. It has two protons and two neutrons, therefore an atomic weight of four, and it's minus two electrons. And if you grab it with a high ionization potential counter, it'll count. But if it travels two inches in air or through a piece of paper, it picks up two electrons, two beta particles, if you will, and becomes helium gas, and it won't count on an ionization chamber. Did you know that this thing right here is given off helium, gas, alpha, comes from uranium? Okay, radioactive material. You pour it out in the hand, and that's radioactive contamination. Is it radioactive? Yeah, it is. Very radioactive. Now, decontamination is nothing but scooping it back up and putting it into the bottle. I just now decontaminated my hand. No, I didn't do such a good job. Not good at all. Is it still radioactive? Yeah, that's called residual radioactivity. Now, under the decontamination rules of the government, when you decontaminate somebody like this that's that contaminated, and this is certainly a reportable incident under current DOE regulations, when you decontaminate it, it has to go down a control drain so that you don't disperse radioactivity. Do I qualify as a controlled drain? That material that I just ate is uh, not soluble in body fluids. Like it's been this. It's uh, it was fired at 940 degrees C, where it becomes U308, known in the industry as HCl insoluble. In other words, it will not dissolve in concentrated hydrochloric acid. Hot. Your stomach has 10th normal hydrochloric acid in it, so it won't even dissolve. The stuff is so fine that it has no texture to it. It doesn't even feel rough. So it's tasteless, odorless, has no texture. How is it supposed to hurt me? Because I've been eating this on lecture tour for two years, the state of Washington felt it necessary to confiscate my uranium samples so that I would be safe. Dr. Fulton from the Hanford Environmental Health Foundation called up and he says, hey, I heard one of your guys OD'd on uranium today, Galen. And we talked for a little while and he says, oh, that was you. And I says, listen, I can eat all that stuff I want. He says, it'll ruin your kidneys. How are your kidneys? They're fine. Well, you should have been chelated within four hours. And I mean, you guys are going to follow me around the country and give me chelating agents every four hours after I eat it on lecture tour? <laughs> He says, we'll give you any medical assistance that you need, Galen. We don't want anything to happen to you. 
I said, did that include turning out the federal SWAT team four days ago to get me? Where are these guys coming from? Well, here's a piece of metal. Density of 19, 19.0. If you know your chemistry and physics, you know that there are only two metals that have that density, plutonium and uranium. Radioactive pyrophoric density of 19. Outside of a laboratory, most of you can't tell me whether this is uranium, plutonium, or a mixture of the two. Now, I said that it's heavy, and it is. Let's see if it's radioactive. Yeah, it is. Pyrophoric, what does that mean? Pyro, fire. Black, on the end. The spark that just came off there is pyro, fire, burned. If it's plutonium, I just contaminated this area of Arizona in excess of the EPA's limit for one square mile of surface. Somebody laughed. It's serious. The end of progress altogether says that I just contaminated you in excess of the limit for one square mile. It's now silver on the end. Tomorrow it'll be black because it self-oxidizes, this, this black color, like this, all by itself. Plutonium does that and uranium does that. Is it hazardous? Yeah, it is, because they take depleted uranium metal and make it into 50 caliber bullets, fire them from shoulder-held weapons. In 1976, they obsoleted tank warfare with these things because it only takes one dog face with one weapon to knock out a 65-ton tank. It'll go through three inches of armor plate, and when it comes out the other side, it's that white hot spark that we just made. And the five men in that tank are dead because it'll burn all of the oxygen out of the air and burn their flesh. 1976, the obsolete tank warfare, and you never even knew that. They make 10,000 of those bullets every day in the United States. We've got enough in arsenal to sink all of Russia's tanks, and our boys in the Defense Department don't even talk about it. Yeah, it's hazardous to your health. Reminds me. Uh, Lead is hazardous to your health, too, isn't it? Uh, particularly if it's in a 45 slug like this and it hits you right here going about 2,600 feet per second. It's not the material, it's the impact from the velocity. Let's be very specific in the words that we use. This particular chunk of lead came out of a human body. My son, who's a deputy sheriff, thought maybe I could use it on tour. That's called dying of lead poisoning. Anything less is a figment of the imagination because it's not soluble in body fluid either. This is a pellet of cobalt-59. If you put it in a reactor into a neutron field, you can convert cobalt-59 to cobalt-60, which gives off a gamma. It becomes the source that doctors use to irradiate patients to 7,000 Rentkin for one patient. The total dose absorbed by radiation workers at Three Mile Island in the last six years is something like 1,500 Rentkin. Five times more given to a single individual in a doctor's facility. Now, do you know why I say that the federal regulations are absurd? And if you live by those federal regulations, maybe you're being absurd, too. Now, a pellet of cobalt-60 this size got shipped by mistake to Mexico, got diluted into 5,000 tons of iron. Some of the reinforcing rod came up to Los Alamos, New Mexico, and they said, hey, that stuff's radioactive. Understand that this single pellet diluted roughly a factor of one billion was what they were reading on a detector like this at Los Alamos. And so they pulled back table legs that were in Spokane, Washington, made out of the same batch, because it was hot and radioactive and it would burn you. 
when the pellet itself could be held in your hand like that for a few minutes without it burning you. Now, Christ walked the earth a billion minutes ago. If I could stretch this, stretch this pellet out into a wire and it went clear around the earth and right back here to Phoenix, a billionth of this amount is 1.7 inches of that wire so stretched out. Stagger your mind? It ought to. Now, let's try a little game. The EPA says that five picocuries per liter of air is the limit for 222 radon. And they handle that like it's a real number. Madame Curie says that one gram, one gram of radium equals one Curie equals 2.22 times 10 to the 12th disintegrations per minute. And that's the basic definition of radioactivity. How many disintegrations is this? Should we find out? And the EPA, in its wisdom, says that 11 disintegrations per minute from one liter of air, you have exceeded the limit. You know what I did the other day? I've been having a little tough with uh, some legal authorities up in my house. So I took one of these bottles of uranium like this, and I dissolved it in an Erlenmeyer flask with nitric acid. And I got a crack in the basement floor, and I squirted that whole bottle into that crack on the basement floor in acid solution so that it'll drive that counter off third scale any place along a 10-foot section of that crack that I put. When they bring the radon measurement in there, can you know what the radon's going to do? It's going to go off scale in their measurement. It won't go that high. If Watrous's house with 17 times this limit in it was caused to spend $13,000 and give it national TV coverage, press coverage, think what Galen Windsor's house is like. <laughs> I went to the trouble to notify my congressman about it, Mike Lawrence, the manager of the Department of Energy in the Pacific Northwest, my state representative, Ray Isaacson, and a few other astute people, including the banker and the lawyers and the appeal court. What are they going to do with that? I set them up on that last Thursday, and I come down to Phoenix, so <laughs> I escaped the folder all. What I'm saying, you is that the federal regulations are absurd. The congressman that put them into place ought to be fired. They ought to be sent home. The regulators, what do you do with them? Quit paying them. The taxpayer, the electorate, elects those people to go out and do a job. Why do you continue to pay them when they're teaching you baloney? when they're putting in regulations that don't make any sense. Cut it out. Quit paying them. Fire them. Send them home. The term I grew up with says can them. Is it easy? Apparently not. You haven't got the job done. The majority of the Congress is irresponsible, amoral, atheistic, irresponsible. Let's see, how many more adjectives can I drum up? But that many. Let me tell you. We as the people sent a bunch of rascals out to the energy store with a signed blank check. And we say, hey, fellows, if you run out of money, just go build us a good power plant. If you run out of money, come back, and we'll give you another signed blank check and guarantee the payment out of the ratepayer's pocket. Tennessee Valley Authority has the most nuclear reactors of any outfit in the place. Not one of them has produced any power since last August. Browns Ferry 1, 2, and 3 in Mississippi hasn't produced any power since last March. 
and they don't plan on producing any power at Browns Ferry until mid-year in 86. At a million dollars a day in lost power revenue per plant and held off in the name of health and safety? Now tell me we didn't send rascals out to the energy marketplace with a signed blank check. They're still getting paid. Those reactors are all fully fueled, fully staffed, and just sitting there. Who's getting taken? The ratepayer. You're still paying more and more for your electricity all of the time. Now, Bonneville Power Administration says that 57% uh, availability is okay for a nuclear reactor. Maine Yankee is often run at 103% availability, which means it's running over nameplate rating. And up days out of the year that its average availability is 100%. Bonneville Power Administration of the Department of Energy says that 57% availability is okay. That means that you can let those things set down 43% of the year, and that's judged as an acceptable performance on the part of the government. There's an obvious answer get the government out of the energy regulating business. Turn those plants over to people who will run them efficiently, 100% of the time. When we put in zero release containment, we started playing games. About the time that we proved that a nuclear reactor has no measurable impact upon the environment, that's when they bottled them up, put catalytic recombiners on them. Some of the reactors in Texas were designed not to breathe for eight years at great expense. Why? When you bottle up a reactor like TMI-2 does, then you get radiolytic hydrogen. And indeed, they had a radiolytic hydrogen burn at TMI-2. And they moan and they groan about that, and all they had to do was open up the windows and let the breezes blow through. You don't need containment on them. I'm going up to Colorado this weekend to meet with the Uranium Producers Association. And they're upset because the government is dumping uranium on the market and ruining the price of the commodity that they get their bread and butter from. But what they're totally unaware of is that the Grand Junction Operation Office is going to issue a contract so that the new operator has a $25 million budget over the next five years, 80% of which will be spent for remedial action, where you take this material dig it up. If you find it, it counts on a Geiger counter, you can have them come in and change out the whole front yard of your house, give you a new front yard, new foundation under your house at government expense. If you don't do it, they'll take you down to the courthouse, blacklist your property, so that you have to remove the radioactivity at your own expense before it can be sold. Now, do you know what I did when I took that uranium solution and poured it into the crack in my house? I set up the United States government and that episode is about to be played. Did I do it on purpose? Yeah, I did, just like I used to dive into that swimming pool and drink that cesium contaminated water. I found out that it doesn't hurt me. You need to find out that it doesn't hurt me, or you. In fact, the only reason for the existence of these big transcontinent distribution lines would be if they could compete with a small mass-produced reactor sitting in your backyard. Why don't they want you to? Because they are the federal energy cartel. They like to set the price, the total availability, and whether you can hook onto it, and if you don't pay your bill, cut you off. That's called power, domain, and control. And they like that. They do not want you to be energy independent. If you had one of these setting in every 10 block area in Phoenix, you could tell the rest of the world to go get lost. Oh, there's another use for that heat. You could heat your homes in the wintertime, or you could cool them in the summertime with it. Heating, ventilation, air conditioning, they call it, HVAC. In countries where it freezes, you could run that hot water out and chase the frost away in the spring and in the fall. And they found out that plants grow faster in warm water anyway. So you'd irrigate with it all summer. 
So cooling towers are called wasting towers. They throw over 50% of the heat away. The other morning coming out of Tri-Cities, WNP2 was putting its 700 megawatt electric up through the clouds, 870. They were running that. And the clouds were laying all over the ground, and there was a little ice cream cone right out there. And I said, there's WNP2. It snows five inches every night out of WNP2, and the rest of us don't get any. Where'd the water come from? That's cooling the heat from the condenser cooler. You should have a business right out there, an oil cracking plant, something taking that heat and using it, like they build at Midland, Michigan, 10 years ago, and they've never used. And so Dow Chemical is suing the utility because they never produced the steam for their chemical plant right alongside it. We got troubles in this country. I'm telling you what the problem is. The doing something about it, responsibility is yours.